Well, welcome to this edition of ROV Meditation Practice Tips. And today, Stephen and I are going to talk about cultivating one-pointed concentration using EEG headsets. So I'm going to talk about using the Muse, and then Stephen's going to talk about using Focus Calm. So let's see, at the end of 2018, Stephen and I discovered the Muse. This is the original Muse, a Muse 1. And um, we experimented with the different programs uh, that they offered. And then we found Mind Monitor, where you could actually graph your brain waves. And we ended up kind of not really using the apps on the Muse app itself, but going and using Mind Monitor pretty much exclusively because we were really interested in looking at the brain waves. But recently, uh, prompted by a post by someone in our meditation community, I was inspired to go back and practice with the Muse Mind Meditation. And this is the one where um, it has three bands of calm and then neutral and then active. And originally in 2018, when I looked at that, I thought, oh, what it's asking me for is to be calm, which means relaxed. So I, I really relaxed deeply into my practice. And I found that the, you know, sometimes I'd hear the rain, sometimes I'd hear the birds. I didn't really find that it was that effective in terms of relaxation and cueing me for relaxation. But what this, um, member of our community pointed out to me that it's really, the mind meditation is really about focused attention. I was like, oh, if it's about focused attention, let me go back and retry this and see what I discover. So as I went back and I tried this, focusing on a single point. So what I um, did was focused on the third eye point and uh, focused on sensations of breathing through the third eye, as if I was breathing in and out through here. And what I found is that one-pointed concentration was the key to that mind meditation. That once my brain locked in on that, that I started to hear the birds sing instead of hear all the stormy weather. Uh, so I did this for a few days. And actually, I'll show... Um, can I share my screen here, Stephen? And, and so here's uh, when I first tried it again, and you can see that it took my brain a few minutes to really hone in on exactly what it was that prompted the birds to sing. And then once my brain did find that, it, it enjoyed that and went along and the birds were singing happily throughout the rest of the, the time. And so I did this for a few days in a row. Um, unfortunately, with an older muse, I found I was getting disconnected um, uh, several times. But then a few days later, I did the same meditation and I did get a successful recording throughout. And you can see that my brain here, pretty much from the beginning, locked right into that single pointed focus and carried through all the way um, through the meditation. And you can see there the, the bird score and the consistency of that. So I said, oh, this is a really nice tool for training focused one-pointed concentration because when I was just focused right here and I was immersed in that focus and that was the only thing in my mind, the birds were chirping away happily and my, my brain was happy hearing that. So, um, so Stephen's gonna talk about his experiments with one-pointed concentration using focus calm. So Stephen, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Kevin, thank you. And yeah, lovely to see everybody. Thank you always for joining us on these practices because Kevin and I really do enjoy sharing, sharing with you our insights and really they're the insights of the community. I think all of you contribute to giving us pointers about what you'd like to hear and where you'd like to go with these insights. So we're very grateful truly to all of you for your input and feedback. So please do comment on this and 
share any insights you've had yourself with with the headsets and with any of the devices because I think they're very useful in giving feedback into your own neural signature I think rather than comparing them between people they actually just simply help you to look at what's happening and the way that your cues and states connect to what's shown on the graphs or, or the kind of feedback that you get in the devices so um, I, I was intrigued with focus calm so focus calm uh, is a device that really does help you to focus and I was intrigued what what level of focus or what particular aspect of focus might give you that you know 99 or 100 percent score using focus calm I tried different things with Muse like uh, Kevin, I, I've owned five muses and they've all, I've managed to burn out all the senses on every single one of them. So whatever I'm doing must be, <laughs> I have my skin, the sweat or the conductivity, or perhaps it's just the meditation techniques or the degree of use, because I, I recorded well over a thousand graphs on uh, muses as I made my way steadily through them. And it was a very useful tool indeed for gaining insight into what my brain was doing while I was meditating in different states. Uh, so Focus Calm is, uh, we're in touch directly with uh, Max Newton and his team. So I really have to thank them. They've been really incredibly helpful throughout all, all of this and kind of giving feedback and being very open to perhaps what, what other algorithms uh, that Focus Calm could use. And they've done, you know, a variety of research. And I was quite intrigued that they've looked at for example, the, the types of focus that people bring. They did a research, in fact, a recent study with um, MIT, MIT Media Labs, and they looked at um, solutions using a focus calm headband with a special scarf that provided feedback when um, focus level dropped. So whenever focus level dropped in the participants, the participants in this particular group that were testing it were given a haptic buzz whenever their focus and attention levels uh, dropped uh, as, as re reported by the focus calm, the, the EEG um, levels. And when they dropped below a certain level, they would actually receive a buzz and it would trigger them to return to greater focus or greater attention. And so I was quite curious about, about this and perhaps about some of the ways that I, I might be able to hack the device, so to speak. I'm not sure I necessarily like that word, but it's used quite commonly. But so I would say, in my in my terms, you know, play a similar melody to the to the algorithm. So I um, experimented with lots of things. I took the device out. I meditated in temples and forests and inside outside. Looked up, looked down, eyes open, eyes closed. I didn't really seem to get any great degree of consistency. I could certainly get it down to zero and get it up to one hundred, but I couldn't stabilize that at the, the right point. It didn't run a consistent flow of, you know, focus calm uh, in those initial tests. And so I, I like Kevin, I looked at uh, really particular points of focus. And then I discovered that with a special type of lion's gaze, so lion's gaze is a um, practice that is, is very much like sky gazing in the tr Tibetan traditions. So the idea or the aim of um, the lion's gaze and, and of sky gazing is to set up an optimal view. So it's a little bit like a child viewing a temple for, a first, for the first time. So you essentially you take in everything all at once and nothing in particular. So it's literally this vast open and view, view for stabilizing awake awareness. And then there's a, there's a particular way you can do it because uh, lion's gaze registers in, in two different kinds of pathways. One is by focusing on the actual non-localized limitless infinite field, which was what I did. And the other one is via the lucidity or brightness of the field of awareness. And both pathways actually culminate in a limitless of experience. So what I did particularly was when I was in this open sky gazing childlikeness where literally there's the vastness of the sky and I was present to the awe of that sky or the awe of the openness so I did this outside so that's a crucial point I was sitting outside literally gazing up in the sky aware of the infinite nature of it and then I literally <laughs> 
focused on the non-localization of the infinite nature of the sky. So it was a particular way of gazing. In other words, you're really exactly as Kevin said, you're actually, your eyes are still, your body is still, your sense of the infinite is present and you're really focused on the, on the nature of the infinite. I'm smiling just because I, I realize how clumsy and foolish my words sound when I'm trying to find, find define non-localization of an infinite field. But, but you get my point. If you go and try this and you try sky gazing, be present to the infinite nature of the sky and then literally focus on that. It's almost as if you're focusing on a particular point but it's not a particular location. It's a non-localized point. So there's a sense at which, in which your actual focus becomes really crisp because you're focused not so much on a single point, but on a quality and a quality within the infinite field. <laughs> so I, I can see Kevin smiling too. So we, we probably we know that we know that aspect, but it's really difficult to put in words. But if you try it again, go outside, open your eyes. So this was open eyes be aware of the infinite nature of the sky, and then really focus on that non-local aspect of that infinite quality of awareness. And, and it's almost as if you're, the, the whole focus gets single pointed because it's single pointed on uh, a non-local feature. That, that's the best way I could describe it. <laughs> and I did, so I did some um, tests with this and I'll share my screen now. I call them experiments in flow. So they were multiple experiments that I did a minute apart. They were 100% repeatable and sustainable. And I lo love this quote. Both Kevin and I love the Taoist sages. You know, those who flow as life flows know they need no, no other force. I, I, I do that. When I was studying Chinese philosophy as a young university student, you know, in my first year, I, I fell in love with Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu and all the great Taoist sages. I, I was sure I'd studied with them before and I had a vision where I was sitting up a mountain, a sacred mountain called Tiantai and, and sitting at their feet. So I'm pretty sure I'd done that before. Anyway, so here's the test. You know, I, I simply went inside, focused on television, being aware of the space around the television and it gave me a flat neutral score. And then in the, uh, you can see in the right hand screen, I went outside 60 seconds later and I simply became aware of the space as I was talking, as I spoke to you about that, the aware of the infinite space while I was sky gazing. So my focus was simply on the, the, the single focused awareness or the, the non-local focus of space itself. And then I went back and I tried it again. So I went back inside, same thing. I could simply focus on the space around the television. So it gave 50, then I went outside again, went within 60 seconds, did the same uh, sky gazing up awareness back inside to the television 60 seconds later, back outside to the <laughs> sky gazing. Uh, so these are all one minute apart, back to 99, back inside to the television 49, back outside to the sky, sky gazing. So it was very stable, really just simply clocked in. It was like using a speedometer, you know, going 50, 99, 50, 99, or 49, 50, 50, 99. So it was a very useful experiment in that sense, in that I recognized how that awareness of that particular child's view of the temple and that and focusing on the non-local limitless infinite nature of the field was actually a focus. I mean, that, that in itself was a curious observation because I tried so many other things to get this exact stability that and they hadn't quite worked. So the lion's gaze or the child's view of the temple and that single pointed focus on the non-local infinite nature of the field itself. Really, there was there was an eye opener. I thought, oh, look at that. How how beautiful. <laughs> so anyway, Kevin, so back to you on um, on this. But it really, I mean, it's lovely experimenting with these. I, I do enjoy it at different times. And um, I certainly am grateful to both Muse and to Focus Calm and, and to all their teams to, for putting together these devices to allow us to experiment. Yeah, so that's a beautiful experiment. And uh, I think 
uh, a number of things here. First of all, I like your uh, cool fish was your your name on there, right? Is yeah. that you? Yeah, cool fish. All right. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Uh, I do think of a dolphin when I think of you. So, <laughs> so um, yeah. So one thing I take away from this is that sometimes we go to a meditation device and and we're using a technique that doesn't necessarily match up or align with with what that app is measuring and we might think oh i'm not doing this right i'm not and it really all it is i'm not meditating right but really it could just be that the particular way you're focusing or the focal point you're using is not what that app or that algorithm is looking for so in here we see that the mind meditation and the muse app is looking for a particular type of focus this one pointed focus and then you found with focus calm that you could actually do a diffused awareness but you were fixed on it in a single pointed way in terms of your eyes were fixed your consciousness was steady there was no movement in your mind you weren't following a flow of sensations you weren't uh, moving to different focal points but you were one pointedly concentrating in terms of having a fixed attention and these apps respond to uh, that type of attention that's what they are measuring so that doesn't mean though that's the only way of meditating or that that's the only way to train your awareness in fact i think it's really important to note that having a fixed point of concentration is just one aspect of attention and awareness and it's actually very important not only to train that uh, being able to fix and lock in and stay steady but it's also important to be flexible in our attention to be able to move attention um, to an infinite number of different points of focus and also to be able to just diffuse out into a non-focused attention there are benefits to our brain and to our consciousness that come from diffused attention and letting go and complete relaxation of attention uh, within a wide space of awareness as well as the benefits that come from being able to uh, really zone in on one thing and stay focused on it so um, if we do just stay focused on something we can get fixed on it we can think that's the only thing it's great to be able to choose our point of focus but we don't want to get locked in that's actually not a healthy state for the brain the brain thrives on being able to focus being able to let go being able to be flexible being able to move attention within a wide space of awareness so in upcoming videos we're going to talk about uh, the importance of flexible attention and also of diffused awareness so thank you Stephen, for this uh, discussion and demonstration and thank you all for watching and thank you for your practice <laughs>